So I would first of all like to thank the center and also the Jan and Navajit and also Christian. And also I, that I see Michael Toyske also to Toyske for, um, uh, you know, sort of kind of encouraging and interesting kind of discussions over the years. And also uh, for, for, for enabling this specific discussion um, and the technical side, which I struggled with, even I struggled with. So I hope other people don't struggle even more. Um, so I also thank you for adapting a bit to my proposal to change the format because I didn't want to speak for an hour because these Zoom lectures for an hour don't work very well in my, in my experience. Um, but I do, have, I do have a kind of overview of the, of the paper and a lot of visuals, which I think are you know, the least I could do to provide some kind of um, visual support to my illustrative points that I'll go through of the paper. So even if you haven't read the paper, um, you know, one can, I suppose, uh, find out some of the themes in it. And frankly, I wanted to have more time for your questions. And, and even if they're not specific questions to the paper, I'll be eager to hear any comments or associations you have um, about maybe similar situations or from your own reading or your own kind of research area. Um, because, uh, I mean, from comments, I, it usually helps me a lot to sharpen my argument uh, of this draft paper. This paper is it, it's very drafty. I apologize also for a lot of the errors. I don't know. I read it again. It was full of errors. So as it's clear, it's a draft that I'm hoping to improve in, uh, through this through this process. Um, and also the kind of the parallels that I briefly indicate in the introduction. It, it has this interesting, I mean, I set it up as this kind of, you know, this type of recruitment situation in the concrete case of, of the Fung areas of Guinea. But I, I mean, in my own reading from, very mild reading from other areas, for example, the mid 19th century recruitment, indentured labor recruitment in, in the Adivasi tribal areas in like kind of certain mountainous areas in India near Bengal um, or the, the Imperial Pacific and the kind of recruitment there before formal Indian indentured labor in the plantations in Fiji and Queensland. It was all kind of this type of, you know, from you know, decentralized non-state societies in Papua New Guinea and the different islands and how that recruitment worked there is actually quite similar to how it worked in in this area in Central Africa. And I feel like my own reading of the Fang, um, of Fang history and this aspect of Fang history, which is labor mobilization after the slave trade, um, has benefited a lot from this, uh, I mean, from my own kind of comparative frame, which I've tried to, to weave together uh, within what I cite as this kind of Wallerstein framework of the fourth world. So not the periphery, not the third world, um, but the world outside of, of even colonial spaces or of plantation of, of, of plantation peripheries, but that are still linked to them through kind of complex, diffuse, informal empires, even up until early colonialism, until the early 20th century, with these type of eclectic uh, groups of you know commercial exchange and um, very localized kind of relations of, uh, of of barter and domination, rather than this kind of. of already properly part of a sedimented empire. Um, and I think that the, this comparative approach has helped me a lot because it, it, in truth, the, the Guinea, this area of Guinea, so this is the Fernando Po, the island I'll be talking about, the, where, the, where the laborers ended up. And then this is Mount Cameroon, where the German plantations were. And then, so the area, between Douala, which was here, uh, also historically a big slave, a slave port, between here and Cape Lopez, which is already Gabon, uh, there, there was no slave trade. The slave trade was massively starting between here, especially in Calabar, the Niger Delta, and also here along Loango. But for various reasons, this area, it didn't have commercial kind of coastal elites. European slave traders couldn't even sail there because of the wind conditions. And then, um, but then the Fang live exactly here, so uh, well more in the interior. And then this is the the Rio Muni, the, what became a Spanish colony. And I suppose I, I'll um, well, I wanted to start with uh, with the, the title of the of the paper, which is "Nothing Is Free Here," which is a bit of a double entendre because um, the quote comes from Tessman's uh, monograph on on the Fang, which was published in 1912 in Leipzig. Um, and he was, I mean, in the paper I go into his person, his character, he went to, to this Mount Cameroon area of German plantations in 1903 as a plantation overseer. Um, but then he ended up becoming 
an, an ethnographer, starting with this book on, on, the, on the Fang. Um, and he's a very original character, kind of forgotten. That's why I was also quite keen on uh, rehabilitating him a bit, because he was quite unique also in the context of German, early 20th century German anthropology, which was kind of much more uh, macro or much more comparativist or evolutionist or obsessed with arts and artifacts and different uh, transitions and evolutions of different peoples and the influence. And Tessman kind of just did the an ethnography of the Fang in this kind of typical ethnographic monograph style, which was, you know, pioneered by Malinowski, you know, just a people and all aspects of it, the economy, religion, production, belief, um, and that's why Tessman, who wasn't really an economic anthropologist, but he still has quite a few chapters on the economic life of the Fang, which is also quite peculiar and, and, um, and unique. So he mentions the, the Fang local, local currencies, uh, which are called the Bicuele. Here, this is a picture from Tessman's book where he says, you know, uh, Eisengeld, it was this kind of iron, iron monies that were bundled um, by rope to establish a, don, a, don, a denomination of a hundred, of an entet. And then um, these were kind of miniature, miniaturized spears. And then Tesman says, you know, nothing is free here. Like you have to pay for everything. You know, umzons is even nix because he talks about someone demanding payment for something. And it was like, I think, you know, uh, well, I mean, the situations where money needed to be exchanged to get things was, uh, was generalized across Fang society. So for example, in order to buy certain spells or love charms, in order to get someone to fall in love with you, you need to use this currency, or even to become an iron forger, which certain Fang people were, who, the iron forgers who made their own currency. In order to learn that craft, you had to pay the forger some money in order to learn it, even if it was your uncle or your father. So all these kind of um, you know, transactional uh, aspects of social life involved uh, these monies, these local monies. And I mean, the, the history of money is key when, if you try to understand what I call this tout modality of recruitment, um, which is how recruitment was initiated and, um, and established outside a fully established formal imperial kind of uh, process of like demanding recruitment through tribute, through levy, through forced labor, through, um, through just generalized colonial monetization of society where then recruitment becomes uh, inevitable. Um, so, um, so this aspect of money and looking at the different use of the pre-colonial money and how it starts being fused or merged with new colonial money, which is what the recruiters are dispensing. Um, so um, this is what I call the, the tout modality of recruitment versus the, the despotic form of recruitment, which is you know typical, extra economic domination by various forms of forced labor and political violence. Um, and, and I mean, the, 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 the despotic form of recruitment is kind of clearly more, more well studied also even in the case of African history, um, various forced labor and Portuguese and, and, and everywhere. Um, but then the interesting thing about the, the tout aspect of, of recruitment is that, you know, a, it involved a key dispensing of money, money also in the form of gifts, of gifts to family members, of gifts in the, in the, in the form of wage advances, that you know, where a lot of people's wages were paid out ahead of time. I mean, when they were recruited, their entire wage was already dispensed and then given to family members. Um, and, then, and then that was sometimes also referred to as a gift, which was a bit of a trap. But then, so it's quite interesting because the, um, this, uh, I mean, this role of money is what characterizes the, the tout uh, recruit, recruiting assemblage. And it, it, I mean, it's not, it's clearly not kind of proletarian because, you know, it involves money because, uh, I mean, if we think of the definition of free labor in the proletarian sense, it's, it is dependence of money, but not individual dependence, the collective dependence of a class on the labor market for their own reproduction, which is how Engels defines it in relation to Moses Hess's essay on money in the proletariat. So, there is this kind of collective dependence on money that can only be gained through the labor market. But if we include these local currencies, um, in a sense, there's also a collective dependence uh, on people's own kind of traditional economy, uh, such as bride wealth. Um, so, you know, that dependence uh, on their traditional economy also kind of creates, in a sense, a new labor market once the different currencies kind of can combine. Um, 
And it's important to remember that these local circuits are just currency filled um, with different types of currencies, even goods that were eventually seen or, act or, or traded as currencies, like, I don't know, different types of imported European wares, like cloth, uh, weapons, arms. Um, they functioned as a currency uh, within these matrimonial, principally matrimonial circuits, because bride wealth in the Fang areas are very high. Like, so these, these, these baskets of Eisengeld, uh, I think for bride wealth, you needed 10,000. So it was probably around like 200 kilos of iron, like 15 baskets or something. So it's bulky. The social wealth was concentrated in these currencies. And then, and then the Fang, they started absorbing also these, these, um, these different types of currencies. In the end, they also absorbed colonial currencies once they became accepted. Um, but they initially started absorbing uh, European commercial goods, which I list up, you know, just miscellaneous imported goods. Um, and then by this, I mean, by this process is kind of what I, what I call with Ballandier, Georges Ballandier, the famous French sociologist, Africanist, who wrote on the Fang in the mid 20th century um, about, about how kind of the, how the colonialism affected and reorganized Fang society. And he nevertheless insisted to say that, um, you know, they weren't acted upon. It was not like money came from, from abroad, from Europe and penetrated, imposed, corroded as, with a type of acid, destroyed the local society. It's like, no, that's not how social change there worked. Um, it was only through the kind of internal adaptation uh, of Fang society that, um, that colonialism was even possible. Colonialism as this process of you know, extracting laborers for the periphery. Um, and um, and this whole process of, uh, of, of understanding the kind of uh, the local economies, the traditional economies that are structured basically entirely around marriage payments and other form of uh, ceremonial payments in the cases of, of minor conflicts or in the case of appeasements, in the case of alliance, the entire social life is, is based around these kind of uh, um, highly transactional uh, events, daily events. Um, and then it's interesting because these societies are also described as egalitarian. Tesman famously says, you know, that they have no chief, they have no political authority, they don't obey anyone. Um, but part of this egalitarian quality of the Fang was actually realized through, the, the, through their use of money as an agent of, as, as, as the way they would organize their own social structure. So these demands on money, especially uh, through matrimonial alliance, are what created this kind of redistribution. Since you know, someone suddenly had an influx of wealth, or some, sudden, suddenly someone went to work on the coast and brought back lots of goods. It's not like he kept the goods; he had to dispense them to everyone, to his in-laws, to his brothers, wives, family, etc. So there was this kind of diffusion of goods through these um, uh, through these matrimonial circuits rather than through the market. Since the Fang were described even by Tesman as a not totally non-market society, they didn't have a marketplace, they didn't have a specialized merchant class, they didn't have external merchants kind of living in certain areas and connecting them. They they themselves spread, absorb these goods through their matrimonial circuits, while exporting. They're also, uh, I mean, since the mid 19th century, they were participant in the kind of uh, post-slavery Atlantic economies of exporting things like ivory, rubber. Um, and, and uh, precious wood, um, which were also, you know, they reached the coast and the deltas through these um, matrimonial payments, uh, gift payments. Um, and then here I have the map, just to zoom out again quickly. Rio Muni here, and then the Fang area, I'll show you now, according to Tesman's map, Southern Cameroon, Northern Gabon. And then the, the, the place where they ended up working uh, was in Fernando Po, this plantation island, which was quite close to uh, Santo Tome and Principe, um, which had its own recruitment networks that were quite different to Angola. Um, so yeah, this is what I mean by the type of co commercial activity on the coast of the turn of the century, late 19th century, early 20th century. These factorias, the Spanish call them in English, in the literature they're also called factories, but they're essentially you know, private trading outposts by different German and British companies all along the coast, usually in the estuaries. And then um, from there, this type of, uh, um, what Wallerstein calls this kind of informal imperial 
um, trading activity occurred. This was occurring way before, you know, the entire paraphernalia of state power and, and administrative rule uh, was even established. And then these are some of the ivory, the ivory economy. And then this is the, this just to illustrate the, the type of economy that is very separate. This is a proper periphery economy in, in front of Fernando Po, which was this island. Here at the top right, you can see Fernando Po, the island from the coast. And then that was just surrounded by, you know, surrounded by plantations, uh, different Creole. So the plantation owners were about 40% Creole, which were these liberated slaves from Sierra Leone in the mid 19th century, some of whom went to Fernando Po, about a few thousand. And then they established themselves as merchants and planters. And then uh, quite a few Cuban planters also came, who were also penal settlers. Um, Spanish settlers, British German settlers from, from Mount Cameroon also came. And then they filled the island with plantations. And then just to get a sense of where the Mount Cameroon was, this picture at the bottom right is of Mount Cameroon as seen from Fernando Po. So at the bottom right, you can see the mainland, Mount Cameroon, and all along the coast there were the German plantations. And they were just exporting cacao mostly. Um, and then the plantations were, I mean, they were, they were quite, uh, it was quite unique, this type of plantation economy in, in an African context, apart from Sao Tome and a bit of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, it was, you know, proper hundreds of laborers, uh, plantation patios, um, a bit Caribbean looking in that sense. Um, and then these pictures are from the 20s to the 40s, so it's, there's not that many pictures from the turn of the century. But here now I return to um, the map. So here is the, the island, Fernando Po. And Tesman sketches this map as the, as the Fang area. The Pangue was it was called in German, uh, Pamwe in Spanish and Pahuin in French, and everyone had their own different name for it. But it's pretty much one group linguistically. It's like, you know, Catalans understanding Valencians in their dialect. Like it's it's linguistically and culturally very similar. The Fang. And then, and then just to give you a sense of space. So when I describe Tesman's recruiting ventures, so he starts in here the Bibundi plantations. That's where his, uh, the plantation where he starts working in in 1903 is. And then he goes to Kribi, which is here on the coast, in order to march inland, in order to recruit laborers for his, uh, for his plantation. Well, he was just an overseer there, but he was, he was promised, he was offered a recruiting license to go recruit. And then that is much more profitable than, uh, than being a, an overseer. So he was, uh, I mean, like many other German early colonists were, they were keen to become recruiters. And then he ends up also here, I mean, he, he tracks his route. And then the second time, I mean, I, I, I sketched two instances where, where Tessman went from the coast to the, to the Fang areas. And the second time he ended up here in Alen, which is in Spanish Guinea, 1907, at a time when the Spanish administration was virtually absent in the entire territory, except in the coast in Bata here. And then, so Tessman, two instances I want to outline and that the paper also kind of contrasts. It's Tesman as a, as a tout. This is just another map of Spanish Guinea in 1903 to give you a sense of what the territory actually looked like because obviously there's no roads, etc. But the roads, the highways, or the rivers, of course. The area of the, the Fang area also gets its coherence from being a, a sense of interlinked rivers. In the south, the Congo estuary is a totally separate river network and very distinct economically, historically. And then this river network is the Fang, so you know, communicable and traversable. And then, so along the rivers, usually there's a series of, of towns that every few years can also be shifted. It's semi-nomadic. And then, so Tessman describes when he goes on his recruiting, venture, recruiting ventures, how he has to pass through hundreds of towns from path to path or along the canoe, with the canoe in certain areas. Um, and then he really frankly just portrays the complexity of this type of recruitment, village by village. And each village is different. In some villages, people are cooperative. In other, in other villages, people try to keep him uh, just to see what else he has. Uh, but they don't, obviously don't offer any laborers. And Tesman can't do anything about it since he's a tout. He's not armed. He doesn't have imperial, formal imperial power behind him. Um, and also the people in the villages, they're still armed in this period. Everyone has weapons because a lot of them are, are elephant hunters, ivory hunters. And then, um, and then so he kind of, he becomes a tout in the sense of, you know, offering people jobs, 
uh, and his plantation, talking about the great conditions in his in particular his plantations, all the bad things that they've heard from another plantation. So all these type of tout scout kind of marketing strategies, basically. Um, he he describes in his diary in detail how, how he has to kind of um, you know find different stories and find different villages. Um, and then this was quite effective. I mean. In, in Spanish Guinea, I also talk about the governor who did a similar kind of tout expeditions along all the area. And I mean, it wasn't as effective as, you know, state, state levied uh, kind of uh, terrorizing kind of recruitment, but there was still always quite a few thousand people a year from this area that only had about 75 to 100,000 people. Um, just by these type of touting recruiting operations that worked essentially as like expeditions going from village to village and handing out gifts, wage advances, gifts to family members um, via these also sub-recruiters, people that the Spanish called ganchos, hooks, who spoke usually a mix of the fang and pigeon. Some fang also spoke pigeon because they'd been on the coast. And then, so then they negotiated there, the commissions, the, the, the appeasements to the family members, the gifts to the chiefs in order to allow them to pass through and continue to implicitly receive as a gift or allowing some of his own basically family members, uh, usually children or, or nephews to leave. And then, um, and then this, the second modality of recruitment, which I call the, well, this is a picture about the tout, sorry. So this is Tessman actually himself. This is from his ethnographic research er phase. So after his recruitment in 1909, he returned. And he returned with all, with funding by the Naturkunde Museum in Berlin. Um, to gather samples and statues and everything um, and in order to do his own research. So he kind of, I think he brought a phonograph with him and um, collected samples. So this is in the kind of Fang village, actually outside of Fang village that was called Nkualentangan, which means the white guy's house, which is still known uh, like that, which is where Tesman built his hut. Um, and then, so in this sense, this image is also representative of this, what I call the touting strategy, you know, trying to attract and trying to allure, trying to capture, capture peacefully people's attentions and people's, uh, people's um, labor. Um, and then the second strategy is the, the despot. So Tesman was of course also a despot, uh, but not, not just because he was a colonial, but because uh, he introduced despotic forms of power in order to um, enforce his own labor contracts. So in 1905, he went as an ivory hunter, because that was, I think, even more profitable at this stage than labor recruitment. Um, again, from Creevy to this northern area of Rio Muni. Um, and then he, um, he, he recounts also in his diary how, like, you know, he would pay people in advance to, okay, you, sh you carry the, as a carrier, you carry the tusks to Creevy and credit and tell the, the, the German factory owner that these are Tesmans and he'll credit me my marks. Etc. That's how the, this kind of commercial network worked. Uh, but a lot of the times the carriers just took the money, the gift, and then just <laughs> fled, deserted back as their home or elsewhere. So Desmond says in order to avoid this, since he couldn't actually rely on German imperial power because in this northern Rio Uni there was none, um, he would himself um, uh, enact what he calls energetic police measures. So if someone would flee with the, with the, with the gifts without fulfilling the contract, he would go to the village, either if he's there, kidnap them or kidnap their family members and wait till they return. And then also whip them, but whip them in this imperial sense of like this regulated, non-intrusive, non non-cutting um, lashing, which was just like a disciplinary uh, formal kind of, uh, I mean, very common disciplinary device amongst colonial authorities. Uh, it wasn't this kind of arbitrary cruelty, it was, you know, um, certain um, counted counted number of, of sticks and then Tesman has this kind of mini bureaucrat also started counting his own whips even though he wasn't really an agent of the state or anything um, but he says that you know without this violence that he himself enacted you know he would have just been looted and robbed like because uh, that's what he's saying like uh, in another anecdote he says that he caught a group of elephants or ivory um, and he didn't even shoot him. It was his team, his team member, his, his subtouts who, who hunted them. And then traditionally the area where something is hunted, the person who, the people whose area that belongs to or whose village is closest, they deserve a small catch, at least some of the meat of the elephant, at least a small share of the eventual profits of the tusk. 
And then so they came demanding to test one something. And test one's like, no, no, I'm not going to give you anything. This is my ivory. It was my bullets. I paid for them. So it's, it's fully my property. And then this village of Alain, um, they, uh, they, he says that they were going to plunder his, his ivory supplies and maybe kill him. And then so he says, you know, preempting that, he you know, went into their village and also kind of uh, attacked them. And then out, out of that, a very interesting thing happens because he says that after that, then Bacon, who was this chief of Alain, who wanted to plunder his ivory supplies, uh, he says a few days afterwards, Bacon appeared just independently in his village, bringing him with him a fresh supply of fruits and goods and, and having a submissive speech about how he's sorry that he, that he mistreated Tesman and how he's going to, you know, um, take care and make sure to supply him with weekly, with weekly tribute, basically. And then Tesman was kind of baffled at this because, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't that respected. And then, uh, and then he says, he says that he found out afterwards that uh, Max, who was a guy from the coast, from Kribi, who's not fun. Um, um, it's not this guy with a gun here pointing the gun at the camera, but it's someone like him, um, who um, lived with Tesman in this hut in Kolintangan, um, and also kind of spoke more Fang than, uh, than Tesman probably did, although Tesman, Tesman also spoke Fang. And then he had shown people pictures of the, of the Southwest kind of genocide of the German troops in, in Namibia and Southwest Africa. And, you know, there's these awful images of like, you know, tens of thousands of German troops with their piss helmets and burned villages and like, you know, starving, starving Herrero. And then he showed, Max showed the people in the area, in the Fang areas, this, this picture saying, you know, these are Tesman's brother, brothers. If anything happens to us, they're going to come here and, you know, raise everything to the ground. We'll be kind of uh, vanquished. And then, so out of this kind of almost, you know, this, this, this spotty publication of threats, then this type of uh, despotic relation emerge where people start, um, well, first of all, not deserting uh, because they know uh, that, you know, Tesman uh, will come after them and maybe... Uh, uh, some of his other brothers will come after them too, um, and then, and then this is when Tesman says in his diary that you know it's it's he, it's he that is the king of Spanish Guinea. It's the the volume two, the from Ausea zum König in Spanish Guinea. Um, and then he goes back briefly to Germany for a bit and then comes back as an ethnographer. Um, but then. Yeah, I mean, this, so this is the type of the scene I was portraying in the paper, and I tried to kind of deduce specifically two, uh, two, I suppose, types. They're not really ideal types, since it's the same person acting under different conditions and different needs. And around this topic of kind of a historically informed theory, I'd like to cite uh, Joseph Miller, basically, because I feel like I really do have uh, true scholarly respect for him. I mean, not only that his great book, Ways of Death, you know, took almost 20 years to, to produce. And obviously it was a, it was a magnificent opus at the end. Um, but also how, I mean, how he was kind of interested in kind of conceptual questions, but not, not, not in this kind of dry theoretical way where you posit your, your, your category ahead of time according to some theoretical school that you want to belong to or you, that you want to discuss. It's like, no, it needs to be a historical theory. The, the categories need to emerge from the data itself and help make sense of the data and of the kind of inherent tensions and contradictions in, in the historical uh, processes. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think he, his, I mean, his type of theory, he never made it explicit, although, for example, in his book, The Problem of Slavery is History, he does kind of um, start, I mean, it is a bit, it's not programmatic, and I think a lot. His book was very harshly critiqued and reviewed by many eminent historians of slavery in top journals as, you know, chaotic, confused, uh, not applying the categories properly, which Miller calls the, F the Finley structural approach of just applying the category and seeing if the definitions fit or not, rather than this type of um, uh, deductive or um, or historical theory. Um, and this, in an interesting way, the book, it's, it is chaotic. I mean, some of the reviewers are right. But um, uh, this theory also only emerges from these comparative leaps that, you know, the, in Miller in his book does, uh, he makes tremendous leaps, even from different ages, entirely different periods. Um, and then, I, I mean, I've tried to do two in, my, in the longer version of this paper. I also look in detail at the recruitment in South Asia, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean after slavery. 
um, because you know these leaps by historians are usually frowned upon or in, received with some kind of aversion because you know it's like no no you have to stick to your area you cannot say anything beyond your area and then but i think a lot of insight and conceptual insight also emerges from this comparative uh analysis which i think miller um is uh yeah i mean one of the best historians of, of slavery who has actually achieved this um, and with that, I think I'll end and hopefully I can hear your comments, questions quite well through this medium. Thank you.